My name's Sasha Pete, and I'm joined by a fantastic individual. Mr. Rob Sherman has held some of the top coaching roles in the country and within Asia. Rob, welcome to join with this conversation today. Thanks, Sasha. Good to speak to you. So um, let's uh, rewind, Rob. How did you end up falling in love with our great game? Well, um, I was born in a place called Aberystwyth in Wales, which is around the West Coast. Um, I have an older brother, and so uh, my dad was a very good sportsman. So I was introduced to the game at a very early age. It coincided with a junior league being set up in 1967 when I was seven years of age. But I was playing morning, noon, and night before that. Um, I managed to get into the local youth team at 13 years of age, the under 18. So I made my senior debut in the town reserves at 14, oh 15 days at 15. And then I moved to Cardiff City and joined them when I was 16 years of age. Um, I was lucky enough to have three seasons there with mixed blessings. Moved to Swansea, had a spell at Hull, but I was out of the game as a pro at 21. Yes. So um, as things, you know, the wheels came off a little bit. Um, but I'd done my prelim badge in my first year at Cardiff as an apprentice. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a coaching award. And during the school holidays, I used to go back home and coach in my old school. Uh, as you are with a sportsman, you, you stay pretty close to your games masters generally. And, uh, and so my games master used to invite me in and I'd go and coach. And, um, and then up, but after I left Cardiff, oh, sorry, after I'd, I'd finished at Hull, I actually came out to Australia and played at Manly for a season. Um, and that sort of uh, repaired me because I'd had a very bad time in my last year at Cardiff and uh, mm. put me back on the, the right track. I went back to Wales, coached in the Welsh League uh, as a player coach at 25. And then I uh, had a couple of hundred games before I was 30 as a coach. And then basically uh, I started to look into coaching younger players, you know, I had a son at that stage and I was asked to coach. And I thought I'd gone do my badges again or start again. And at that stage, I could have jumped straight into the B license, but through an admin cock up, I ended up having to do what's called the Junior Leaders Award. So that was lower than the prelim badge. And it's probably the best thing I ever did because I realized all of a sudden what I didn't know yes. and how much of it I didn't know. So I started the journey again in my 30s. Um, and uh, through that, uh, a job came up with the Welsh FA. I applied for it and I got it as an area coach. So I was the first area coach in Cardiff. Um, there were other areas that had them, but that was the first that Cardiff had. And basically from there on in, I've been very lucky in the sense that I then moved on to become National Player Development Manager for the Welsh FA technical director. Then I moved to New Zealand as high performance manager. Um, they had some financial difficulties. I left the organization after a relatively short time. I set up the Asia Pacific Football Academy, mm -hmm. which is based in Christchurch. Um, then I got headhunted by FFA with, through Hamburger to come in and work in the coach education department, yep. which I headed. Then back to uh, Australia, uh, sorry, New Zealand as technical director, then uh, to Melbourne Victory, and then back to uh, FFA as a very short tenure as, F as technical director. Um, yes. During that time, I've also been lucky enough to work with you know, teams like the Canadian women's team uh, during the L London Olympics and other campaigns, and a few times with the Canadian men's team, which was nice yeah. and rewarding. So the, the Canadian women's team, um, they, they ended up getting a bronze uh, medal. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's, it's nice when you're involved as a coach and you, you see the success on the park. Um, obviously, that, that doesn't, um, doesn't happen. But you're, you're, th throughout your career, you've, you've coached um, quality junior sides like you were at uh, – you had the – you had uh, – some of the junior Welsh, Welsh boys are under 16s. Uh, I yeah. mean, you, you coached uh, men's sides, you've coached women's sides, um, you've had uh, administrative roles where you coached coaches. Um, so you've done it all in our great game, um, Rob. 
what is it that you think has made you uh, or propelled you to the pinnacle of coaching um, in this country? Uh, well, I'm not so sure about uh, specifically to Australia, but I mean, ultimately, when I was at Cardiff, I was a very inquisitive player in the sense that I'd ask questions. Mm. Um, there was a managerial change um, and the coaching staff that I sort of uh, fell under didn't seem very keen on answering them. So uh, <laughs> I had quite a lot of falling outs, if I'm honest, as a 18 year old. Um, you know, I was, I'd have questions that might, you know, might not be playing that great. And they said, well, you need to get on the ball more. And I'd say, okay, how? And it would be just work, work more. Well, you know, I ran, uh, I actually was an international athlete as a kid. So I could run for fun. And I was running for fun, but I didn't have the solutions to get on the ball more. Mm. So it sort of motivated me to not, not to be that type of coach, to be a coach that actually would have or be able to help players find solutions. Yeah. And I think that's luckily become very much the modern vernacular in coaching. Mm. And so um, philosophically, that's aligned me very much to the changes in the game over the last 20 to 30 years. Yes. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to, you know, in some cases to be party to a group of people who've helped lead that, um, both in Wales and in Australia with Kelly Cross, where I think, uh, you know, we wrote, rewrote the coaching structure. And so, and it's that, uh, I suppose, a little bit of that, you don't have all the answers, but you might have some of the questions, mm -hmm. is the guiding force for myself. So, and I like to be solution-based, so uh, I don't like just to whinge unless you can come up with a potential solution. It might not be the one, but if you put something on the table, I think uh, the wisdom around the table often finds the answer. And, uh, and that, that tends to be my approach. Um, it doesn't always work, but there you go. Yes. So, uh, yeah, so it, it seems to me that um, if, if you're going to be, uh, take it to the nth degree in coaching, and, and, and different people get involved at, sort of different levels. The vast majority of coaches, um, let's be honest, uh, they're the dad uh, or mum of uh, one of the kids in the team. If you look at every uh, team around the world and who's the coach, it's probably somebody who's, you know, uh, stuck their hand up or been forced into to coaching the side, right? But then it sort of progresses um, where, you know, some of us go out and get, go through that education pathway and get your badges and then go on and you get, it gets more and more professional, but the vast majority of coaches around the world, or even in, in Australia or New Zealand, um, it's a mum or dad uh, trying to do their best. Yeah. And so um, what advice do you have for those individuals who are starting um, on their coaching journey to help them along those first couple of years? Well, I, I mean, I'll give you an anecdote in the sense that in Wales, we introduced in about 98, I think, something like that, that you had to hold the, the Junior Leaders Award. So you had to have that award to coach a minor, so a player under 18. Um, and the, the sort of rhetoric was going to be, oh, the, the game, the numbers of coaches would fall. Drop. Because yeah. we'd drop. The opposite happened. The number went up. Mm -hmm. And actually, the number of players went up. Oh, wow. And it was ironic that a lot of people who, as you rightly say, you know, fall into that space, they're a volunteer, they're sort of, no one will take the team, so mum or dad, and you know, I'll do it, you know, type of thing. Um, they often don't know um, how to approach it. And so with a little bit of guidance, they get enthused and they feel more comfortable. Mm. So I think the, the, the main thing, in the, the sort of junior and that youth space is, first of all, you've got to make it interesting for the players. So attention span isn't great. Yep. So don't talk too much. Um, keep it, keep everything active. So if you can, even the, getting the boys and girls onto the pitch, making it an activity, you know, getting the pairs, last two on the pitch. I, and so everything is fun. Yes. And uh, that's the first thing. Secondly, don't try to coach too much. At, at the end of the day, if you ignite the player and, and they're active and they get lots of touches on the ball vis-a-vis, -vis, that's why we have small-sided games and 
practices where you get lots of ball contact, they'll come back. And that's the, that is the ultimate acid test is you, is retention. And in a, in a sense, I'm not quite sure that we measure that well enough um, retention rates. Mm -hmm. And if the churn rate's high, then that's an indicator something's not quite right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great words of wisdom. So the, the what I take from that and, and other people have said that, so try and be the excitement officer. Uh, yeah. So you're, instead of trying to be the coach, right, and, and getting those, the jacket that says coach on the back of your jacket, mm -hmm. you know, see if you can be the excitement officer to try and get the kids loving the game so that they're going to be excited to come back the following session and the game and then it, it propels. Yeah, absolutely. One of, one of the best experiences I ever had was uh, in my role at, as an area officer. I set up a schools program. So I used to go in and coach in primary schools. Mm. And the class numbers in Wales might be sort of 30 plus to about high 30s in terms of a class. Mixed co-ed schools, mixed group. So you'll have someone in the class who plays football, someone who's never kicked the ball in your life. And We'd go in or, you know, you'd go into the school, you'd make it an activity so the kids would come out, you'd put them in a square, you know, run around, get into twos, get into threes, make it all fun. And basically, you'd find that next week, the kids were dying to come out. Girl, boy, played before, not played before, dying to come back. And that in itself was just a, a real reward. But it was also a good lesson. It sort of it honed your communication skills and how uh, less can be a lot more, and uh, especially with young ones. Attention span's not great, so waiting for a turn yeah. is not a good thing. Yeah. You, know, you, you need to be active. Yeah, so um, it was interesting that there's been, I think, a, a lot of research, uh, you know, uh, uh, Drew Taylor's master's on uh, in, in putting a PDE, uh, putting PDE as part of the drills, this idea of, you know, waiting three minutes to, in a line, right, yeah. to then do a drill and then take the stopwatch and then it's another three minutes or two minutes before that person goes and fetches the ball and then joins it in the line. We need to, we need to think about, is there a better way of doing those types of drills? Um, like you said, obviously, the more touches on the ball, the more activity, um, yeah. the, the less. How, how would you encourage coaches to... Think about that idea um, and eliminate those sort of uh, time wasted in a session. How, how can we start thinking about doing that better, Rob? Well, I think the first thing is that if you start with a very simple activity, so argument's sake, you know, um, you have people in a square and they're with a ball each. So they all get a touch to start with. Then you might say, right, get into pairs, one ball between two, okay. move round and pass. So start with something very similar to sit simple and slowly make it look more comp complex mm -hmm. and don't make the complexity too big a leap because often players don't grasp it. Then you spend a lot of trying, time trying to explain the activity, et cetera, et cetera. And that's when the boredom sets in and the, the, the loss, if you like, of, you know, so I know the vernacular, make it simpler, make it, you know, uh, yeah. make it harder. And, uh, and I think if you look back at the curriculum, the, it was sort of no, no files and drills. That's not yeah. to say files and drills are bad, but they are if you wait two and a half minutes yeah. or you make a mistake and that's your, your go over, then how do you learn? Because mistakes is how you learn and yes. you need to make plenty of them. Yes. So we almost need to encourage the mistake because... 100%. Um, the, 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 you know, you know, think about any job that you do, uh, some of my greatest learnings have been from my biggest failures uh, in my workplace. How is that any different to a kid, uh, learning how to play football, right? It's exactly the same. Um, and, but yet, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, scolding. If I remember when I, when I played as a junior, um, you know, the, the coach would, scream in the language that he, um, his native language, and I would understand exactly what he was telling me. It, it didn't stop me loving the game, but uh, I learned a, a few choice swear words in certain um, uh, uh, different uh, 
cultural ethnicities are here in, in Melbourne and uh, Victoria. So um, I think, again, it depends on age, but I mean, if I relate back to my own childhood, so that's a long time ago now, so we're talking about the 60s, you know, you played with a peer group. And what you learned was, or you played with a group, what you learned was, at some time you'd walk down the local park and there'd be no one there, so you'd play on your own. Mm -hmm. So not every time you went down there would there be the select group of players that you wanted to have a kick around with. There'd be, be odds and sods. So if you cheesed any of them off and you upset them by being critical, too harsh, blah, 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 you didn't get a game. Yep. So you, everyone made sure everyone was involved. Simple as. Once 2-0, change the teams. That's boring. And so... Yeah. Uh, kids, kids knew about constraints theory, although they had no idea what it meant, because they would adapt the game. The one who's a bit older who could beat everyone, they were on two touch. Mm. And, it, and they were told it's because you're the best. And they were so happy being told they were the best, they didn't mind the two touch. Mm. Now, you, this is seven and eight year olds doing this, not adults. Mm. The problem with adults is they view, in, often in part, an adult performance mentality. Yeah into the environment and that's not why kids are there they just want to have fun and it's interesting that you said that because even uh when when i started playing football in the the early 80s it was um uh, unorganized play we'd go out yeah. to the park you know the 2v2 the 3v3 set up the the cones cones with uh, they weren't even cones, they were bags, school bags typically, that were goals. And we would just have a pickup game, right? Yeah. Um, that doesn't happen today. So my children need to, it needs to happen through organised play. So my wife will say, okay, can, can, can my kids come over and play with your kids? And it's settled and there's SMSs and yes, and, and they're off playing together in the park. Um, so how can we encourage our children children to do that um that love for the game um and what we had you know decades gone past and that i would hazard i guess that would have happened for a very long time um but now within the probably last maybe 10 or 20 years has really dropped off and every session has to be at a, a coach an organized coach or an academy or a you know uh, even a birthday party that has a a soccer yeah. um, reference. How do we get kids to do more of what we did um, to do that constraints-based learning and that self-play? Well, I think, I mean, it is extremely difficult because there's a number of re reasons for that. Obviously, parents mm. themselves are a little bit more reluctant to let them go out and et cetera, et cetera. But um, I think there's a number of things. First of all, I think the first thing is if you can create more game-orientated activity, so... Uh, in training, so when they turn up, it's more game orientated. Okay. Help them learn to self organize. So you might say, right, well, you know, off you go in small groups of six and set up a game, and they can go and learn how to do that. Then they might repeat it. Um, the other thing is, I, I was proposing in FFA with the community team that maybe we just set up a, a mini ruse just play program. So you turn up three nights a week and you just play. Wow. You don't train. You just, there's small sided of games going on. You play for five minutes, change, change either teams. And by that, I mean, you, you, you just change, you play with different players. So you don't stay in the same three or four. They just change your teams all the time. Therefore, the score becomes irrelevant. You get used to playing with an older player, a younger player, a better player, a worse player, which is exactly what happened in previous periods. Okay. And that's all you do. You so just do that. So your idea was organized, unorganized play. In other words, so you're trying to you're trying to force the same the same ethos of what we did, uh, sort of intrinsically, but in a, okay, a very interesting idea. I will uh, obviously put that one on the ideas board. Um, but yeah, I, I really like the way you, you think. Um, so let's now sort of dial the the notch a couple of uh, steps. Um, to the junior coach that um, is, uh, or, or senior coach that has just got maybe their first badge. Um, and they've, okay, so they understand the game a, a little bit better. You know, they've probably played, um, so they have a general, you know, good understanding of the game. Um, but now they're really 
you know, the, the first, now they've understood what the football problem is, okay? So yeah. in the Australian framework, go watch a game, you do your first coaching badge and you go, okay, now my mind's blown. I'm never going to watch football the same way because I'm looking at the football problem within the game and I'm not just sitting here as a spectator. Um, well, that's what happened to me with my first badge, yeah. right? Um, so um, tell me about what, that group of coaches, what, what's the most important for them? So I think there's a number of factors there. So it's interesting you, you raise that thing. That's where the match was in the middle of the model is actually, it's a way to learn more about the game is to watch it. So you could come on a course and I can show you a system. The, the problem is you probably just adopt that system. Whereas if you go and watch games, you'll go, oh, Bielsa does something different than Klopp. And you can, you, so you learn by watching, really. So that was one of the fundamentals of the, the match at the middle and why those tasks are there. The thing I'd say is if you're in the, first of all, uh, you, you know, you're a, a sea licensed coach, you're on the journey, you have some vi uh, opinions about football, which are formulating, and they do change. So, you know, uh, you know I was initially a very much a 4 4 2 man, long ball, blah, 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 because that's what I knew. And then over time you go, hang on, there's a better way, or I believe there's a better way. Um, but that, that's by the by. So the other thing would be uh, taking senior or, or youth football. With youth football, the context is it's individual development, but there's a team element. In senior football, there's a team element with individual development. Mm. So I think the, the, the thing with... We need to split the conversation here now, right? So we need, you need yeah. to address both sides. Okay. Right. So basically in the youth cup framework, I'm looking at the players in front of me and I'm looking at the traits they bring and they'll be very different. So you'll have, you know, as an example, you know, might have a lad who plays fullback or a girl who plays fullback and their passing is great, but they don't join in much. So my feeling is, well, make, build on what they're great at, you know, their X factor and add, a complementary element to their game. Just maybe they can support a little bit more, but don't try and make them a jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. Same with, so you might have a fullback then who's great at joining and, you know, goes past people, overlaps, gets crossed in the box, but his distribution isn't great. Well, just improve the distribution a bit, but actually build on what they're great on. And that's your problem every week is how you raise the standard of the individual. So I'm not too worried about the collective performance. I'm not going out and watching, you know, um, my opponent at the weekend and analyzing them. The game's just a dress rehearsal. That's all it is. It's a dress rehearsal for 10 years down the road. And so, you know, and, and the game tells me whether who's learning, who's not. And, and if someone's not learning, it doesn't mean they won't learn. It means they might, they might not be understanding the message, which is down to you. They might not be, uh, they might be in a, a slower learner. And some are, you get the ones where, you know, they get it and they get it straight away. And then you get the slow drip ones who all of a sudden in a game, you go, blimey, what happened there? All oh, it's all come together, but it took four years. Yeah. And so in the senior context, again, oh, depending, we'll just stop there know. because yeah. we need to stop there. I'll tell you why. Because Rob, I go watch a lot of football at all different levels. Um, yeah. And what I see is a level of intensity or intent for coaches to win. Um, it protrudes their, uh, their skin. Okay. Um, so, how are we going to change that dial, um, you know, 5%, 10% every year to start getting through to coaches that winning's nice, but it's not necessarily the be all and end all about what your job is as a development coach. Um, and that, yeah, it's, it's, it's important for the kids to learn how to win and teams need to be in the right um, category so that they win some games and they lose some games. Um, but I think that performance has drifted down all the way through. And I don't think it's ever left, it, to be honest. Um, you've got some coaches in some clubs that that's all they care about. And they'll go out and recruit the other player and the rival team to join their club so they can win the flag. Yeah. So I agree with you totally. So, I mean, ultimately, 
you know, you're looking at that and going, well, who's that really about? Mm. Is that about the coach or is that about the kid? Oh, that's self-evident, right? It's, it's, it's about the, the, the coach. Yeah. And so your, your validation comes through, your, you know, your record, I've won the league, done this, done that. Mm. But, you know, I think, you, you know, again, that's a philosophical approach. You, you know, you, if that's the way you are, that's the way you are. But personal validation is that if you've helped improve someone. Yes. And, and secondly, if that person's still in love with the game. Yes. I, um... and, and, and if they talk to you. So, I mean, I'll give you an example. I, I went up to see Carl at the Jets and Joe Ledley was out there. And Joe and I had a good two-hour chat. The coach Joe was a 16-year-old, both for Cardiff schools and the Welsh national team. And it was like talking to an old mate, albeit, he's, you know, <laughs> he's a, a, a lad I coach. And in a way, I went back to Wales in about 2.10. Yeah, about 2.10, I think. And I was in, in the Vale of Glamorgan Hotel. And the current national team were there, which included Gareth, Ramsey, people like that. And they all come over, oh, Rob, great to see you. And you go, that's nice, because it validates that actually they respect you. And B, you didn't ruin them. <laughs> yes. And, and think about uh, now you're talking about players who, you know, these are superstars of the game, right? It's yeah. literally, uh, they're playing at the pinnacle of the top leagues uh, in, the, in the world. Um, and we're, we're, you know... Um, so words of wisdom um, but, but I've got equally so I've got on LinkedIn you know I've connected with a few lads who are coached and didn't go on but they're involved in football you know they've yeah. gone and taken an alternative career some in physiotherapy blah 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 and they still keep in touch mm -hmm. and, and that to me and they're still in love with the game and that they're probably the ones who actually matter most in some respects because you didn't turn them off the game. I mean, my influence would have been very small. I had a very small contact with them, but in credit to their coaches at their clubs, they didn't turn them off the game. Okay. Um, so I'm learning heaps uh, at the moment. And like I said, my only goal, and, and I would encourage every other junior coach uh, who would watch this is um, my only goal is that, the, the 18 boys that I've got in the squad end up loving the game as much as I do. That's it. And if, I, mean, I, if, I, yeah. if I can impart that to the boys in my current squad, I've done my job. Um, Just so, a small point there, because I, I think the, you, know, you often get so that it, it's about uh, you know, this anti-competitive. You can't have a winner in a race and all this stuff. Of course you can. Yeah. No one's saying you're not going out to try and win. So some of the basics are you're trying your best. Mm -hmm. you're going to run, you know, going to run and you're going to, when you don't have the ball, you're going to work hard and all those factors. Yep. They're, they're non-negotiables in some respect, yep. but ultimately making mistakes, um, you know, missing a sitter, blah, blah, blah. It just doesn't matter in the big scheme of things. It doesn't matter. And, th and therefore <laughs> are not winning the game. If you've tried your best and not winning, doesn't matter. So Let's double click on that point because, you know, every I can remember missing the sitter when it counted in my mm -hmm. under 15s game, twenty, almost thirty years ago now. Right, so um, it happens. It's football, um, and uh, in not this year because of COVID, but last year I. You know, I lost the game um, scoring an own goal. Nobody, need, nobody needs to tell you, right? Uh, I, didn't, I wanted to clear it, but yeah, it came off my boot and went top quarter. Great goal in the wrong side, right? So how do we, how do we um, refrain from coaching the obvious, especially when it's a mistake? It's a sitter, um, young boy or girl in a situation. How do we as coaches... Um, learn to grow so that we don't coach the obvious. You know, there's been a mistake. Um, it's typically a sitter or a goalkeeper. There, that's where the, the 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 extremes of the mistakes get shown in front of yeah. goal or at the back. Um, but mistakes happen all around the park. You know, in the middle all the time. Um, but we criticise those a little bit less because it's less uh, less important, let's say, right? Then the, the goal scoring or the goal conceding opportunities. As coaches, how do we um, do the right thing not to coach the obvious? Well, I think the thing is, you know, if you look at the sitter, how did it arise? That's what you need to applaud. 
So okay. how did the ball get there and, and hone in? So that's okay. You know, keep doing that. We're, it, it, it'll come, okay. you know. Um, I think the other thing is body language is a major factor. So one thing I found very much with the 15, 16 boys was how they constantly checked you. So if someone missed and you're doing that one, you know, oh, although you might not say anything, there's the message. On the other hand, if you, you sat there calmly and you're like, keep going, thumb up or something of that nature, doesn't mean you don't care. It just, because it matters to them. It sends a different message. 100%. And another thing we used to do is we found that, um, again, with, with that adolescent group getting into you know, that, that maturity phase. So, for instance, when we made substitutions at half time, I noticed how uncomfortable the rest of the players were. They'd almost look at the player who's getting substituted and it created a lot of discomfort. So we, and often because the player didn't know it was going to happen and his reaction. So as an example, uh, you know, this is a, in competitive football, obviously, you know, internationally. We, I'd grab the lad who maybe I was making a change with at half time and just say, I'm going to take you off at half time. It's a tactical, blah, 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 whatever the case may be. And it would be always be the truth. Just so you know, they would know it was coming. When you mentioned it, they'd be up, chest out, upright. They knew it was okay. coming. Yeah. And the boys would look at them and go, oh, he's all right with it. We're all right with it. Yeah. So it's uh, giving people the heads up that the, the, the bad news is coming, but you've, yeah. you've told them very quickly. Okay. So um, as, a, as a, a precursor to that, uh, making changes, would you, would you suggest that you could make changes? I mean, in, in, um, in junior football, it's like basketball. You know, you make as many substitutions yeah. as, as you want, right? Obviously, in the, in the form of the game where we've got, you know, a, a, a limited amount of substitutions, it's slightly different. Um, is, is that something that in the junior form of the game, uh, you would make substitutions at halftime or just, you know, five, five minutes, two minutes later? Yeah. I mean, personally, when I coached in junior football, which I did, we had a rule. So I was asked to coach a team and I said, recruit me. It was eight to side in those days. Recruit me 12 players. And what will happen is four will play a full game and four will share a half. So the other eight will share a half. Next week, another four will play a full game. And it rotated like that, regardless of who we played. And then we'd have the parents saying now and again, well, it's a... a a top game today and don't care it's so-and-so's turn so-and-so's turn so-and-so's turn and actually it was amazing how the boys um owned that as well it was like no no it's freddie's turn uh, and and they tried I and mean, actually they were very successful i think four of them went on and played a very decent standard but and four played other sports but not okay. football yep but you look at it and go I, it's just, you know, does it at eight? There's not, you don't want to be stood on the side waiting for a go. Yes. The, uh, so uh, that sort of uh, gives the, the frame. So at our club, we've got a rule that every single player will get 50% game time. Um, you need to you need to earn it, but but uh, obviously there are parameters of you know you need yeah, to sure. you need to have been at training etc. Um, I've got a fantastic team manager that clocks to the second every I get a report. Um, actually, I think I've got the best team manager at, at my club, but um, he, he tracks with an app that when the player when every time I make a substitution. And uh, this year's COVID, but last year, my least amount of player got 70% game time, right? But it was that, that analysis that helped me make the decision making. I didn't have as rigid system as you, but I would ensure that if, you know, you know if, if let's call it Johnny, if Johnny uh, went down underneath my mental threshold, I would pump in with game time to bring his minutes up. Yeah. Um, and it just, it made the, all the parents um, a lot more satisfied because everybody's getting a go, right? There's nothing yeah. worse than you, you're paying decent money and effort and time and you see your kid on the bench. It's not nice. Um, so what do, you, what do you feel about um, how should clubs um, institute game time? Well, I do think minutes and percentage of minutes is a good way to go. So, I mean... Again, if, how you work your formula out there. So if there's 
you know, 18 in your squad, then actually it's 90 times 18 is the, or is the parameter minutes divided by, but anyway, you can do a formula where actually it's not just 90 minutes available, is it? So, yeah. um, you know, uh, but any, I just think that is a good way. It keeps, keeps the coach honest. It also gives you potentially the feedback to parents and they, you can say, well, they are getting game time and it's, and it's not just a cursory five minutes at the end. Yeah. Um, and, and I also think that it does change the parents in a way, their, their attitude to the game changes because they just see it as a game. It's not the FA Cup final, it's a game. Okay. And people are getting game time. And as you, you know, and it does change things a little bit. So again, it, you know, we had a rule again with parents that if you saw good play, opponent or your own, you had to applaud it. Okay, that's a good one. Uh, and th- and things like that. So, and, you know, I often in those days, you had to referee your own game. And yes. if anyone shouted at me, I used to just walk over and go to the whistle. Fancy it? You're going to referee the game instead of me then? And they, you know, no, shut up then. Yep. <laughs> so. This is, uh, yeah, so really, really good stuff. So we're going to now shift to the, the, uh, the, sort of, let's say, call it the, 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 the senior side of coaching. Yep. So we're going to switch gears now. That same C-licensed coach, um, understanding the football problem, but now we're, 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 we're coaching adults or, you know, yep. young men, men or women and uh, the game. What, what's important for that coach in, in taking that, that team-based approach? Talk to me there. Look, I, think, I think, first of all, you know, um, as a younger coach, you're often a bit, as a, as a new coach, as I say younger, but as a new coach, you're often a bit insecure. And that, that can manifest itself in many ways. So you might not engage the group, if you like, in, in maybe setting the culture. So that's one thing. So you're trying to implant the culture, but it's best if you can set it collectively. So they have an input into things um, around, say, the behaviours, standards, etc. that they, and if they start to police it, you don't, you're not the, long, the bad guy all the time. You know, you're the one who, who's focusing on other factors. They're policing themselves. So that's one factor. Get, get, get the players involved in the culture and the aspirations for the season. So if they say they want to win the league, but they'd only turn up to one night's training a week. They said they wanted to win the league. They're full of shit. <laughs> so... You know, you, you can get the group to say, well, what, you know, what, are we, what, what do you think we need to do to that? Well, everyone needs to be at training twice a week, three times a week. Great. So how do we police that? What's the expectations? The other thing I'd say is that, um, you know, uh, you, you may often inherit a group of players. Yes, of course. Um, you know, and that's often the case. And, and obviously recruiting them in senior football is a factor. But don't ask players to do what they can't. Uh-huh. So... You know, if you have a centre-half, for instance, who's not the best on the ball, you know, get him to play out very simply. Or yeah. she to play out very simply. So, but, you know, use their strengths because that's where they flourish. That, that's... And, and you might have to adapt your style of play slightly. Okay. But that... oh, you've said a word. You've said one word that resonates really well with me. Okay, and, and if I had to sum up my whole football philosophy in one word, it's that word, adaptability. Mm. Um, so you're a, you're a senior coach, you've got a, a side, okay? The cattle yeah. on the park is the cattle on the park, right? So you might have an idea the way you want to play, but depending on, you just said it then, depending on how inherently what they've learned Okay, you, they've already progressed. You're going to be able to modify them a bit, but you're not going to be able to revolutionise these players now, right? Yeah. Um, then you're not going to make them Barcelona if they if they play just you know uh, long and direct. You're not going to be able to get them playing small tiki tackle through the middle, right? So the whole idea then goes out the out the window in my books. Okay, so what is your idea about? Um, coaching to the cattle that you have on the park? Well, I think the first thing is, there's a number of factors come into this one is, you know, if you, if you actually are a Barcelona coach and that's the way you want to play, mm-hmm. don't go and work for the team who, who play with a long ball. Okay. For a start-up. Because you're not, you're not married. 
Secondly, if you genuinely believe in coaching and that actually improving performance is part of an ongoing education for players and yourself, mm -hmm. then actually, yeah, be brave enough to coach and don't just settle for, but you don't expect the leap in one giant one, step. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right? So in, you know, look at what you've got and, in, and, I t uh, and identify the quick change you could make. Okay. And work on that. Get yes. your gains, get your solidity, and then slowly uh, address other matters. Yeah. And this it's is where it, you know, so you're asking key players to do what they can do. Yes. And uh, and and you often find that the lower level you are, the more rigid you are. That sort of do this or this, the better. The higher you go, obviously players are game intelligence, execution's a lot higher. You give them the parameters and often they'll find the solution. Okay. Now, what about the quality? Because even the, if you look at any league, right? So um, if, you've got a, if you've got a top three side, okay, in a competition versus a bottom three side, the quality, regardless of the league that you're playing in, in the world, right? The, you're going to get dominated. If you've got a bottom three side, okay, not, not all of us coach the top, a top three side. So if you've got a bottom three side and you're going to get dominated, right? You know, maybe holding, you know, uh, holding the ball and playing the tiki taka won't work for you. So I want to, I wanted you to to touch on that idea of adaptability, and the fact that now you're going to get dominated in the game. You know, you're going to get yeah. dominated again because you're a bottom three side. You're not going to make a, a top three side overnight. So what did, what is your idea about a readjusting your your, your idea about how to set up, how to play, because you need to get a result, right? So the, the team needs to stay up. You don't want to get relegated. You want to keep your job. Um, what, what, what would your idea be now to those coaches? Well, I think if you take the, the concept of the problem, and I know people don't like the term problem, but it's, you're taking the concept that it's problems you can cause them, problem they cause you. Yep. Let's say, the, as in what you're describing is, the scale is tipped massively in their favor. They can, they can cause you a yes. lot more problems you can cause them. Yep. So now you're op opposition focused. In this essence, you've got to nullify those threats. Yes. If you've got any chance of, or those problems, if you've got any chance of actually securing a result. Yes. There'll be other games where, where it's even, and there you yes. can focus on them and you, and there'll be others where you have the ascendancy, and yes. you're focusing totally on your, the problems you can cause the opponent. And that's the conundrum. So... If I'm, you know, if I'm uh, Fiji and I'm playing Germany, I'm going to be focusing on stopping Germany playing. Okay. And, and on, uh, give, know, me, that, give me some ideas. Give me some ideas, practical ideas. That you're, 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 you're the weaker side. You know you're going to get dominated. But what is it that coaches come and implement? Some ideas and the principles that we have for those coaches. So the first thing is that you have to see how they attack. So, you know, are they a team that actually is a possession-based team? Are they building up? Is that their style? Uh, when you press them, do they go long? How do they go long? So you, you basically are trying to come up with contingencies to deal with that. When you win the ball, you know, are you looking at what opportunities do you have? Okay. Are they, is it a moment they're exposed? Is there a moment, or are they super organized? In which case, you know, uh, you may be looking at things like set plays where when you get in the final third, you know, and you get a free kick, are they, are they vulnerable at those moments? So you're trying to look at their vulnerabilities okay. and then look at the, so every four, every style and every formation gives you something and it takes something away. Okay. And when you compare it with yours, your own style and philosophy and philosophy and formation, beg your pardon then, you know, you're giving something and taking something away. So you may adapt your formation. You might mark a key player. You might do a number of things that nullify some of their assets. Yeah, defend a little deeper or, you know, or, or concentrate on yeah. the central. Yeah, okay, got it. You might, you know, you might, it, again, you know, you might find their strength is wide, in which case you show, show inside and win the ball centrally, where you can counter quickly, whereas if you win on the wing, it's sometimes more difficult to actually around, secure yeah. the possession. Yeah. But these are all factors that you need to look into, and ultimately, it's a trial and error. Ultimately, over time, you get more astute, 
And then the other thing is how you manage within the game. So what is plan B? So I'll give you an example. We played England at uh, Telford many years ago and Stuart Sturridge uh, scored uh, a couple against us. But we went one down. And in truth, we'd only really, because the England teams were often young men, whereas we had, because our selection wasn't so wide, and it was a benefit in some respects, we picked who we had. Yep. So our, our lads might not be fully mature. But we didn't have a plan B. I think we lost the game 2 0. And uh, spoke to the lads afterwards and said, you know, I sort of said, I think we, I've let you down there. We didn't have a plan B, didn't have a, a way to get back in the game. How do you fancy when we go and play Scotland? You know, we work on a 3 4 3 as an alternative. But ironically, in the Scotland game, we, the boys were like, yeah, we'll have a go, whatever. We didn't need it in Scotland. We, we beat them 2 oh, 0, and they didn't cause us any particular problems. In the last game, we played Northern Ireland, but we had a man sent off um, yeah. after 25 minutes. Perfect. And we, went, we, we went to a 3 4 2. Yeah. And I actually bumped into the coach at FIFA, in FIFA, the Irish coach, uh, probably about three years ago. And he said, it, it was about the like 91st minute they worked out what we'd done. Wow. And we, and we beat them uh, with 10 men. And it was all because we'd worked on plan B, and the opportunity came. And we actually implemented our plan For a B. previous but, game, but yes, I got it. Yeah. The and and that adaptability within the team. So, you know, you might have one, two sitting and then you go to two tens, one six. You might, you might, you know, drop a man, mid the, the six into the back three and push the full back. So what's the adaptability mm. that changes things when you need to? That's something to look at. Fantastic. And what about that scenario where most games, you know, you're, 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 you're even, okay? So, and, and football's a game of inches. Very, you know, the, the, the idea is very simple. Score one more goal than the opposition. But, you know, it's about moments, you know, and often sometimes it's a mistake. Um, tell me about what is it that you're trying to do as a coach when both teams have got a really good chance of, winning okay how are you trying to get the inches over the opposition what in your ideal ha, give us some useful tips i think again you're looking at the game so uh, how many times you go in at half time and you rant about the wonder goal from 35 yards which actually is a freak you've come become completely distracted of a one-off incident it's a mistake by a player and you you get focused on that instead of looking at the trends the game is telling you. So with the games evenly balanced, you know, what are the, what are the trends that are leading towards some of your successes and the trends that are leading towards some of theirs? Mm. And if you can take some of theirs off the table and accentuate yours, that might be enough. Yes. The ref still might give a bad call. You know, the ref might still make a decision. Out of your hands, uncontrollable. Don't worry about it. I, I have to be honest, I get really upset with people who get upset with the referee. I just, it, 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 the ref makes less mistakes than the coaches do. And the players, 100%. And having having held, get so, over it, for yeah. God's sake. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I've, got a, I've got a real sympathy for, for referees. I held a whistle for a couple of years. Um, I wore black, so I, I know exactly what you mean. I... Um, so any, any coach that wants to know what it feels like to, to, to be in a centre, go and spend a year being a referee at any level and you'll understand, you'll stop, uh, you'll have a greater appreciation for referees. So I hate VAR as well, but I'll just put that out there. Okay, no. so I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm okay still with VAR, but anyway, let's uh, continue on, uh, Rob. So yeah, the, uh, the, the, the idea of now videotaping we, we won't talk about the dominating how you're going to dominate because it, it, it's it's sort of obvious right uh, the, the the domination aspect it's a lot easier when you know you're going to dominate a team you need to execute a plan so we'll we'll, we'll uh we'll, we'll stop there but now um what about video analysis in both junior settings and senior and senior environment what's your idea of whether coaches should videotape their their games for a learning experience. Okay, so I mean, again, there's uh, nothing more uh, powerful than actually watching yourself as a player. But in the junior space, you know, you're looking at 
asking players to look at the things they did well as a starting point and maybe the, and how they could improve them and then looking at things that maybe they didn't do so well. And those could be reactive things. So maybe reacting poorly after a miss, losing the ball and not recovering, things of that nature. Don't want to go into too much detail, but I think it can be very stimulating if the players then have a little look through Huddle or whatever platform you can use, make some notes. And then if you can build on that, you start building that developmental mindset, but without it being too developmental. So yes. they're playing still to love it. Yes. Uh, it's not just another lesson. It's, you know, it's not a trudge. It's about, so there's a fine balance there with, you know, you only want to skirt. And this is where, if they yeah, can at identify. The very least, if I can double click on that point, at the yeah. very least, it's, it's a highlight reel for them, for the goals they scored, right? So you're videotaping the game and you can get, clip out the, the goals that the, the kids scored and say, here you go, here's Johnny's goal, here's Mary's goal. Um, you send that to the grandparents, right? Yeah. Um, or, or just or get them to highlight something they think they did really well. Okay. And then you might go, well, how many times did you do that? Or three times? How can you make it five? How can you make it ten? You know? Perfect. Okay. Um, the, the, the bit, the, as, as they get older and a little bit more, obviously, as they move through that egocentric stage and they move into more uh, uh, understanding their role and, and, and what their assets are, you can go into much more depth as they get older around the individual. Uh, I wouldn't get too bogged into the tactical until they're much more mature. Um, in terms of senior football, well, it's a tactical imprint. Then you're looking at how the tactics are going to come about in a game. And that's what you're demonstrating in the video. Have you lost me there? Um, yeah, so the, uh, the idea of now videotaping for a senior, uh, senior environment, what are the benefits to that? Well, I think words and pictures is a fundamental. I mean, if you are able to illustrate, say, for instance, aspects of your play that you've been working on and are coming to fruition, and you can fine tune or illustrate some of the uh, elements that are working and some of the elements that need fine tuning. Equally so if you do have video opposition and you can say we expect these type of things, the, you know, the fact that they're visually um, evident, Blinded. it supports learning. You know, there's those who, who basically they see it and they get it. There's those who hear and hear it and see it. And then there's those who experience it. So, you know, then you replicate that on the training park. So that's why it's very important if you're doing your tactical session that the opponent plays and poses the same problems in your tactical session. Yeah. It's no good just having a 4-4-2 four, four, out there who don't play or don't present the problem that you anticipate, yeah. uh, you know, at the weekend. What, what percentage of coaches do you think that are doing video analysis at any level? I don't know, to be honest. At the top level, everyone. Yep. Uh, absolutely everyone uh, and there'll be you know a number and there'll be individual analysis going on at the top level also yeah in terms of uh Down the leagues I, I, I mean as an example in the new zealand national league all the teams are and it's you know it's a semi-pro amateur level um they all have in stat they all use that platform mm -hmm. um that might imply to some clubs at the next year i would imagine a lot of mpl clubs are doing it i mm -hmm. would think Mm -hmm. um, that would be my expectation. So I would think it's quite common. Um, you know, you just, the, the key is, is synthesizing. So again, it's the trends. You, you can't show every moment, you know, they do this, 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 this. What are the things that actually are the jump outs? You know, if you take X and Y off the table, it will actually, you know, limit their potential. Or actually, if you capitalize on X and Y, you know, that's your, your opportunity. So I think that's the thing with analysis is if you're not careful, you can paralyze your team through analysis. Yeah. It's, it's the key aspects and how they fit into your model and your philosophy. What about this, this idea about, um, we've, we've, in, in Australia, we've now got this, this coaching uh, framework. Um, obviously, you, you had a, a big part of sort of implementing that, that coaching framework. Um, and sort of unpicking that 
to, let's say, the old school principles of play, um, you know, that, that were around before, you know. So how do we, how do we apply those, the, those original ideas of principles of play to now have a sort of the modern game that sort of needs to be espoused either in, in, in senior football or in junior football? What, what, how do you sort of merge those worlds? Well, the principles of play have never been off the table. Okay. So if you took that, but the, you know, the, but there's some things that are taken as written, which might not be true. So for instance, you know, support and cover in marking, in defending is not everyone plays that way. People play man to man. Yep. There is no cover. Yes. So, you know, you have to be a bit careful that you say it's a given. You know, a lot, most people will have support and cover and work on a zonal basis. But you'll notice that there's a lot more mountain marking in and around the ball. One-on-one battles. Yeah, there's, a, there's yeah, it, it, the modern game is more of a... Yeah. Mm. So, for instance, you know, like uh, width and depth. Well, you know, a lot of teams play with their wingers narrow, for instance, and then the fullbacks might get them width, depth. Mm-hmm. They, they're, they've never changed, or, or I would say they've been around. Are they covered specifically on the course? No, they're not, uh, not that I'm aware of. And the key technical points. So the thing is, again, we might say, you know, get into line with the flight of the ball to control it. Not everyone does. Some people just stick a leg out and control it. Yeah. Now, the point being, those things are easily covered and actually probably should form part of the distance learning. Mm. Um, and I think there's a danger that, so the, the model was designed to teach people of the how and not the what. Okay. So a process by which you can go away, watch football, identify a problem, design a session, and work on that problem. Now, the football knowledge, I do think there's some elements that have been missed, which would include some of the principles of play and would include key technical points with and without the ball, um, which I think, again, you know, could easily be covered with video and DVD, of course. And, I, and they were areas that uh, I think in the latest conferences I was suggesting we did cover. Yeah. I also think that you should be uh, the C licensed youth needs to be much more specific. So again, it's three days and it merges back in the senior. I think there should be a B youth, an A youth. I also think there should be a C and B junior for players under 12 because uh, uh, the pedagogy is very different at those age groups. Mm. And these are all gaps that were identified and actually Sean Douglas pre-COVID was in on the process of actually addressing these. But I, I you know, Sean was stood down to two days a week or something and Obviously, that's all been um, delayed. So these are things that we're aware of in terms of the knowledge bit at the bottom of the pyramid. Actually, you know, there are gaps in terms of football knowledge that uh, maybe further down the, the pyramid would be better with a bit more what rather than just the how. Okay. All right. So a little bit more prescriptive rather than sort of leave it up to the coach to... To... Well, I'm not necessarily prescriptive, just a case of actually saying, well, here's some things you need to know. Okay. Um, ultimately, you know, uh, yeah, ultimately the idea of, of giving someone a, uh, manual. Yeah. a manual and saying, follow that, you know, the danger there is that you, and it's happened with a very loose manual, you know, people actually don't, Understand. one of the reasons that 1433 is, was used is because it's so versatile. Mm-hmm. Right, but ultimately, you know, people are very rigid. The ten has to be uh, the seven, eleven have to stay wide. No, they don't. Okay. The six can drop into the back line. You can push the full backs on, and you can quickly go to four, three, three with a narrow front three. There's a whole raft of things you can do. All you got to do is be brave enough to experiment. Yes. So you and think- in truth, you can play any style of play can be brought to life in any formation, really. Yes. Okay. So, do you think that most people don't really understand? Um, the ethos of the curriculum well enough and then criticise it? Is, is that where you, what you're saying? Well, I think, I think people look at it and go, and they see the 1-4-3-3 three, three and they go, it's a Dutch formation, Dutch, Dutch, Dutch curriculum. 
Mm. And it's not. So, I mean, you know, Kelly Cross and myself with Hahn wrote the curriculum. Predominantly, it's around the style of play and the style of play statement. And all we did was put processes in place. So there's processes there that you don't have to follow at all. But the bottom line is, in the absence of an alternative, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the key. That, is, that last bit of the sentence is where you've got me right in your camp. There was no, in the absence of a system, if you've got a philosophy, if you've got a framework, if you're a coach and you know exactly how you want to play and you've got everything sorted out, okay, all power to you. And as you progress up the, the levels, okay, that is what you're encouraged to do. Yeah. Go out and develop your own system, your style of play, articulate it, you know, in your, in your A license and your pro badges, that's exactly what you need to do, okay? Yeah. But in the absence of that, here's something for you to formulate your ideas with. So is that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's that copy to create culture, novice to expert. So ultimately at the copy end, you go on the internet and find your sessions. Yep. As you start to become a little bit more knowledgeable, a bit more au fait with what you're trying to do, you design your own. You know, you won't find top coaches going on the internet looking for the session for the boys on Monday morning. It won't happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's... And that journey, and in fairness, you know, we've all been through that journey where yeah. we've gone copy to create. We've, we've, you know, you make a multitude of mistakes and you've got the wrong alley a hundred times as a coach. And what all we tried to do is provide a cheat sheet, if you like. Yeah. That would help people get there sooner so you know what's your opinions and beliefs on football vision state statement you know key principles in the main moments you know player task cues if you can write that out then you're pretty advanced okay in the, in the absence of that here's one you can follow to start with if you've got another way of doing that you don't believe in having a statement that articulates your football good for you but then when you're in an interview what are you going to say spot on Okay, um, so um, you have uh, many, many gems in there. Thank you so much, uh, Rob Sherman. I want to um, pivot now um, because you are, you had what I would class the top job in uh, the country. I mean, but besides, yeah. I would say the, the national uh you know, coaching one of the national teams or the Matildas or the Socceroos. Yep. Um, it doesn't get, I would think, if, if you want to be a professional coach, it doesn't get any better than being the technical director at, uh, at the FFA. Um, and um, you touched on at the start of the interview that you had a, a short-lived experience there. I'm sure it didn't, your, when you took that role, um, having worked in the organisation for many years before, your idea wasn't for it to be short-lived. No, not at all. Um, in fairness, you know, I left the organisation for a reason previously. Um, I felt it was going in a direction that I wouldn't be able to live with. Um, when I had the opportunity to go back in, you know, I, David approached me, David Gallup, and it was obvious that, seemed obvious that there was an opportunity for change. Um, having said that, uh, some of the barriers, you know, to change still exist. The, the federated model, for one. Yeah. Um, the real inability to uh, galvanize or lead from the middle is difficult. Um, obviously, there was a hiatus between David and James coming into the organization. And then there was some obvious things that were going to materialize pre-COVID, which I think COVID has exacerbated. So the financial situation at FFA, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So for, the, for me, the governance, finances, and uh, it meant that I, I could have the job, but I wouldn't be able to do the job. And mm. actually affecting change in Australia is, I would say, impossible under the current governance structure. Okay. So... Uh... And, and what we're, so just for those who don't know, you can go out very quickly online and look at Rob Sherman's P, P, 
piece called Out of Crisis, A Fresh Approach to Australian Football. He's articulated every word of his position. Um, what I want to, and I've, I've read this, uh, there's many, many points um, that I agree uh, with you uh, in this document. But first, I'd like to understand uh, more of the context. Um, because we are, we are living now what the statement you wrote in that document. I'll give you one example, okay? One example here in Victoria that is different now to um, the, you talk about the federated model. Um, uh, Football Victoria has made the decision because of COVID to play um, that there's no NPL uh, 13s. 13s will go mini roos, uh, nine aside. Um, where the 16s will go to 17s. It was basically, 2020 is a write-off year for Football Victoria. Um, yep. All the year, all the boys go one year more. I'll give you an. This is I'm using this as an example. Um, go one year forward, so we go 14s to 17s. Okay, um, but in New South Wales, it's what it's different. Okay, mm -hmm. so exactly what you're talking about, right? So I'd like a comment on that first. Well, without knowing the full details of what they why they've done that, it would just seem to me that you know, thirteen, you start moving into that game training phase. I think there's no reason to change that, especially in where you are auditing the clubs and their programs. So they're supposedly in a decent and quality environment. The sixteens to seventeens, well, the problem we have is that a fifteen-year-old or a young sixteen-year-old might not be ready for the seventeens. Um, equally so, in fairness, a, if it was 16s to 18s as previously, you could be a same know, problem. Yeah. Same problem. There's always that problem, but it's uh, you know, that, and that's where looking at long term development over results is a key factor because you, we, we, but we understand that. So, without going in the detail, I think that the, 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 the thing that resonates is that in every state, you have a thing called the National Premier League, but it's not, it's a state league. Regulations are different in every federation. That's what I wanted to comment on. Uh, and ultimately, that wasn't the premise of the original National Premier League, but it got watered down in every state be to suit uh, the many, uh, but not the few. Got so it. instead of set, set that you would now have a natural second division if you'd set the Premier League as it should have been. Yes. So basically, We've got, and I'll say, you're saying that each state federation does effectively what it wants. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, you know, I think it does. I mean, I'm not saying they don't want to be cooperative. That would be... No, of course that'd not. That'd be wrong. And there's a, a, a lot of good work that goes on in each federation and some very innovative things. And the Victoria have done some in the sort of social football space, for instance, very innovative. There's the, you know, talent support programs that they... Yeah. Look, and it, you know, that's a lifesaver for regional Australia. So there's some good stuff going there, but in the big picture stuff, so like a national academy standard across the country, you know, we, we put something together, we put it out to the federations, didn't get any feedback. You know, um, you know, it was in the Christmas period and it was sort of delayed and, uh, and then obviously ran into COVID. Now that should be up and running. And ultimately then, Clubs can choose whether they go for that academy standard. It wouldn't be incumbent on playing in NPL to have it. Yeah. But the A-League clubs would have it. Yeah. And they would reach for the category two or three. And then other clubs could reach it. And that would demonstrate their capacity and their intent in terms of youth development. Then you could sort the wheat out from the chaff. Because ultimately, you know, as we know, not all the uh, NPL clubs actually meet the required standards. Yes. Um, and the, and the, them granting the the of uh, the MPL licenses was many moons ago, right? So it was based on uh, financial contribution many many moons ago, and that's the reason why the the vast majority. And I'm not talking about the ones that have entered more recently, but um, the vast majority of those MPL clubs were entered in many many moons ago, right? So and they've still got the same uh, license. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, I don't know whether the, the license is annual or three year or whatever, but it should be annual. So because there's always a danger that you sit on your heels, the coach leaves, you don't replace, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I would just say that the, 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 
the differences from state to state is a challenge. Yeah. And, and also, though, if you like, um, the fact that FFA, you know, you have a situation where the money doesn't go to the middle. So often the states are better off than the national body. So, you know, they, FFA gets something like $11 million from the states and give back something like nine. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that all the money should go to the middle, but ultimately, where does all the money go? There's so much duplication in the game. So CEOs in every organization, boards at every organization, et cetera, et cetera. So if we talk about the cost of football. Well, one of the costs is it's inefficiency. Yes. You're repeating everything seven or eight times. Well, if you think about um, the, the amount of money that each of the federations get, um, yeah. both state and, and the money that goes to FFA, of the overall fee, it's, it's a s- small fee. Like if you look at m- some uh, NPL clubs, it, it's, it's a $2,000 fee, right, for, to send your kid to play. And, then, and let's say uh, at a community club, it's three, four, five, six hundred dollars eight hundred dollars um to play to play football and of that percentage i know you've got you know lights camera action you know the the club and you've got a kit and all that sort of stuff and and some some clubs pay their coaches etc but of the overall fee let's say for example uh, it's a very small dollar amount i think ffa gets something like twelve dollars per head out of a youth player yeah so, you know, when you talk about the cost of football, the cost of football isn't necessarily what's going to the Federation or the FFA. Yes. Not far from it. But what I'm saying is that, nevertheless, there is millions of dollars raised yes. from that, that it, not to the clubs now, that comes through fees. Yes. And yet, it, I'm not sure that's used efficiently. Okay. Because there's, there's duplication. All right. Now, this is the question I need to ask. Okay, because to me, it's still not clear as part of your manifesto at the end. When you took the job, okay, what was the framework for you? Because you've now talked about how to fix the game in Australia, okay? You're really talking about things out, maybe, and that's why I'm asking the question, outside of the preview of a technical director, okay? You're talking about now how to revamp the whole system, Okay, it's it's almost uh, what I would see if I was a board member and I saw somebody wrote that. Okay, you're 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 now effectively applying for the CEO position. So when I, I disagree, see the CEO should put that to life. It's the football people who should decide the direction of the game, not the administrators. Okay. So uh, when I took the job, I, I basically it was about uh, improving the elite side of the game. Yes. So helping Graham and uh, Ante to a degree, but ultimately what you put in place wouldn't help them. It would be 10 years hence, you know? Got so it. it was the elite side of the game, including junior team, the junior national teams. But the technical director's role, if you take the FIFA model, is a double pyramid. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. Mm-hmm. Um, you have the community, so the community game and the elite game. Mm-hmm. And the overlap is the bit where players transition into the elite or not. So that's often your player development programs. Yeah. But the, the reality is that you have to take the holistic approach. You have to look at the whole ecosystem because Makes if sense. you don't get the, it right at the bottom, then you have fewer numbers coming through, et cetera, yes. et cetera, the whole thing yeah. together. And so when, you, when I looked at it, you couldn't divorce yourself and say, I'll just sit over here, be irresponsible. I'll just sit over here and look at my little ivory tower mm. and I'll and sod the rest of the game. You can't, I couldn't do that. Yes. Now, uh, this is where I fundamentally disagree with the CEO runs the business. Yes. The technical people should run the football. Okay. Now, this is where communication is very important. Okay. It's about expectations of a role. Okay. Yep. So when you go into a role, okay, and I run a large business, in my role, prior to going into the role, I need to know what it is that you want from me because I need to know whether I can deliver, all right? So prior to you getting the role, what was the agreement that you would be in charge of, okay? Because it seems like to me that the frustration that you've written in this document is that you had, you've always had these ideas, but you were punching your head up against a brick wall. 
Have I summarized your, your thoughts? Yeah, I, think, I mean, that, that's very common, you know, across all my experience, if you like. I mean, you know, we were able as a group in Wales uh, because of the technical strength of the technical department to influence change, but it was not easy. Okay. But, um, but, you know, the, the reality is, and this is the reality, I knew the reality would be there. I mean, I was just hoping, if you like, that I would have a better chance of influencing the football and, and really taking charge of the football side of the game. But I'm afraid that the administrators in the game are entrenched in believing they're the football expert. Okay. So this is what I'll, 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 I'll double back, okay? Because yeah. you haven't answered my question. What was the agreement? When you took the role, what would you be your preview and your control? Because all uh, the ability to execute any task is about the agreement when you're, when you're talking you know, as part of your role, your remit, your roles and responsibilities to be able to execute because you can't get upset about something that you haven't previously agreed that you're going to do, whether it's any relationship. So what was the agreement in um, that idea as you took the role? Well, I was under the impression that I would be steering the football side of the business. Now, in fairness, that wouldn't include competitions. Okay. That wouldn't include competitions. Uh, but it would include all development. And it would include not, I wouldn't be directing national teams in the of sense course. of. Yeah, that's a separate. Yeah. Yep. But I would be working with national teams, but I would be looking at all development of the game. Okay. Now, in that context, this is, uh, I think, one of the challenges. And, and again, I knew that was the case. But once you started to get second tier discussions happening, unbundling yes. of the A-League, does not football and development sit in, in there? Because it took me ages to get involved in the second tier discussions. Are you saying that you weren't invited to meetings? I was eventually, but it took some time before that became a, a, a fact. So um, I think probably in the latter part of my tenure, I was invited to the New Leagues Working Group and the same with the second tier. I think I sat into two meetings on that. Mm. So, yeah, so it was latter in the, in the mix. And, uh, okay. Yeah. But one thing to be involved in the conversation and another thing to have the power to able to execute your opinion. Would you agree? Oh, uh, well, I mean, uh, again, you have to be careful in the TD role that it's not just your opinion. Okay. Right, so it's not about Rob Schumann coming in and doing what Rob Schumann wants. That's that's not the case. But there is a there is the need for based on your experience for people to maybe to take heed on some of the comments you make, mm -hmm. and also, you know, formulate football intelligence, if you like, mm -hmm. from people who actually know aspects of the game, and bring that to the table. Got it. And that was proving very difficult. Okay. So thank you for sort of uh, putting an exclamation mark on uh, Out of Crisis. I encourage everybody to go out there and, and read that. You get a, um, an idea of what it means now, coaching and being a participant in football in Australia. So this has been a fantastic interview, uh, Robert Sherman. What advice do you have for us coaches? Um, they go out there and coach on, uh, on a weekly basis? Well, first of all, enjoy it. Make sure you enjoy it. Keep a smile on your face. Um, the, uh, if you're in the senior game, you're going to get the sack, so don't be surprised. Um, <laughs> if you're in the junior space, you know, make sure you just put the player first. Yes. And the thing for the, the whole technical side of the game is uh, stick together because without each other, you can't live, can't survive. Yeah, real words of wisdom. I like that idea of uh, sticking together, smile on the face. There's been a lot, a lot of gems in this uh, uh, longer than usual interview that I do. So I hope uh, people get uh, really good value out of one of the greatest minds that, uh, that is uh, coached in this country. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, sir. Thank you so much. Um, for sharing your time and your knowledge. 
Um, and I hope really other coaches got as much out of it as I did tonight. Well, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity and uh, good to talk. And uh, I wish everyone in Australia the best. I do have a real soft spot for the country and from a football perspective. And I really hope it goes from strength to strength. Um, you know, and in 20 years time, you know, we look back and go, I was wrong. I'd be delighted. Yep. Yeah, I understand. So um, thank you so much, sir. And, um, and uh, to, I'm, I'm sure the, the next, uh, you're going to be doing uh, great things in years to come. Um, men like you uh, continue to, to add value and you've done that tonight. So thank you once again. Thanks, Sasha.